In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our workers' meeting. Thank you for your people. Thank you for their faithfulness. And thank you for this work in our hands. We are praying, Lord, that this work will prosper in every one of our hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Every worker, every section, use us to be a blessing to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. And as well, you see your people as channels of blessings. We pray that your blessings will flow into every worker's life, Amen. every worker's family, Amen. every leader's family. Amen. And the great desires of their hearts will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, we pray that you will not be hearers of the word only, will be doers of the word. And the blessing of obedience will follow every life. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Actually, it is not just an interesting chapter. It is an enlightening chapter, and it is something that has the commandments of the Lord. And it's not something we should just read and pass by. Many of these things we have heard before. But I pray that the Lord will renew our understanding in these passages in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 9. It says, Let love be without dissimulation. We try to find out that word, dissimulation. It means without deception without hypocrisy and without any deceit at all let love be without dissimulation let it be without deceit without double dealing without duplicity without hypocrisy without pretense without ostentation it's not something i want to do this i want to do that i'm blowing a trumpet without ulterior motive, without saying, I want to plant this so I can reap that. Let love be without dissimulation. Let it be without showmanship. And then it goes on in that uh, verse 9. It said, Abhor that which is evil. It may shun that which is evil. Reject that which is evil. Jettison that which is evil. And totally abandon that which is evil. Then it says, Cleave to that which is good. That is, be wedded to that which is good. Be joined to that which is good. Let that which is good become part of your life. That you know that you and goodness you are wedded together you are married together as a wife cleaves to the husband and the husband cleaves to the wife let goodness cleave unto you and it says in verse 10 be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love it says there should be kindness coming out of our hearts there should be compassion coming out of our hearts and then it goes on to say it should be with brotherly love and it should be as if you were born in the same biological family as if you were born by the same mother brotherly love the love of the brethren actually you are redeemed by the same blood of jesus christ which is thicker and stronger and greater than the natural blood and then he goes on to say in honor tell me preferring one another it says uh, should make it a practice actually when we were younger in our secondary school uh, age uh, days uh, they used to tell us that if a man and a woman if you had to pass through a particular door they said ladies first women first and now we say sisters first it means that in honor you prefer other people you and another brother you prefer that brother you and another sister you prefer that sister you make that a principle and you make that a practice and you do it so often and you do it so early it becomes part of you it says that will show that we're actually having the kindness i'm coming to verse 13 it says distributing to the necessity of the saints, distributing to the necessity of the saints. That is, you cut down your own luxury so that you can meet the need of other people, what is necessary, 
basic, important, essential, indispensable in the lives of other people. You're not living in such a way that you are so comfortable and you feel so convenient and you are living in luxury and you are living in abundance when your neighbor, your brother, your sister, a member of the family of God, when he has nothing and when he's going hungry and when he's being deprived in life and you are living in luxury, it says that you will give to the necessity of the brethren and says it says uh, giving to hospitality. In hospitality, that means when people see you, at least you start with a cup of cold water. At least you have some little things you're able to give them. The people that see you, the people that visit you, they're not going to, you know, we're brothers and sisters and he wouldn't mind whether he minds or not. This is a commandment of scripture. And it says we distribute to the necessity of others and then we have hospital. Look at verse 15. It says rejoice of them that do rejoice. The thing may not interest you, but the thing interests him. The thing may not excite you, but it excites him. Maybe you've married long, long ago, and then you've forgotten how it feels when people nearly get, uh, when they get married, and then they're excited, they're happy, and then you see him, and he's having, you know, kind of this uh, exuberant joy. You say, what's happening to you? I got married. Uh-huh. I got married to you. 40 years ago, because you've forgotten how it feels. It says, don't think about how you feel. Look at that person rejoicing. It's passed an exam. It's got a certificate. It's got something new. And it says that you rejoice with them that do rejoice. And then it says, weep with them. Tell me that we is just lost somebody he's lost somebody and you understand because uh, you know it doesn't affect you you are a child of god and uh, this person has just lost his wife and then you see him doing his service or after the service and he's looking sad looking unhappy looking dejected say my brother maybe you've not heard what happened and then he tells you you know i, I just lost my wife or i lost my husband was she a believer yes or say a believer, yes, he's gone to heaven, and since he's gone to heaven, aren't you happy that your wife has gone to heaven? Is that not what we're all praying for, that God make me ready, I want to be ready, and she was ready, and she left, and that's, that's why you're happy, come on now, cheer up. We don't do that. Even Jesus wept. He knew he was going to raise up Lazarus, but when he got to the grave of Lazarus, first of all, he groaned. He was sad with him, and then he wept. And the people said, see how much he loved him. And we need to weep with the people that weep, and then we we'll rejoice with the people that rejoice. In verse 16, it says, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. That is, you shouldn't carry your certificate on your forehead. You shouldn't carry your position on your face. You shouldn't carry your exaltation in the world all around. And the people who are low, the people who are jobless, the people who are not as high as yourself, you identify with them. That's what you're saying here. Actually, these are commandments, and commandments are made to be obeyed. It's not just that we read through. I know you are going to teach at this in the you know house fellowship, but you know, if we're not doers of the word ourselves, if we're not obedient to the word ourselves, if we're not carrying out the word ourselves, and then we'll just go and rattle it out in the house fellowship, it will not work. The Lord wants us to be doers first, the people that practice before the people that preach. That's why it's saying that we should be of the same mind one with another that means get under their skin and feel the way they feel and see what they see and go through what they're what they're going through and then it says mind not high things but condescend bring yourself low to men and women to brothers and sisters of low estate and it says be not wise in your own conceits 
you know there are people they say they are christians i hope so but you know as we interact together and as we meet together the opinion must always be number one their ideas must always be accepted another person is not wise every other person is foolish every other person is ignorant they are the only people that know it says you know the wise in your own conceit don't deceive yourself and think that you are the only wise solomon and the rest of us are ignorant people don't do that even if you have an idea so pay that even if you have a suspend that even if you have an idea put that aside and say i prefer that brother i prefer that sister give them chance to talk you know sometimes i discover in our local churches um, at least i know what happens uh, at the combined service i watch people you know sometimes so say uh, this is the first question and then the teacher reads out the question and if you want to answer and i always see a particular person i don't want to say brother or sister so that you'll not guess who i'm talking about and that person always comes out i appreciate the fact that the person knows the bible the person knows the scriptures and the person has actually read the thing but all the time coming out and then if you have any question after we finish the study scripture and there's somebody that always coming out at the combined service of those people and then you are wondering why is he always having a question and sometimes when they ask the question it's going to be a personal thing do not be wise young conceit give chance to other people so that we know that this is a fellowship this is an assembly this is a congregation and then he has something to say she has something to say i have something to contribute and then we're sharing together and then i come now to verse 20 therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him if uh, he thirst, give him drink. Before I go on to the rest of that verse, you know, sometimes we allow other people to change us. They will forget the scripture. There are hundreds, I'm going to say, there are thousands, I'm going to say, there are hundreds of thousands of people, church going people in this our country that they have changed the concept and the understanding of what the Lord wants us to do towards our enemies and they have their prayer books and they have all the system and there are people that have bought into their prayer system and it's to destroy the enemies and it's to kill the enemies it's to be bitter against those enemies, they are here me they're stopping me they're not allowing me to make the progress i need to make let this happen to them let them die let so if anything happened to them and they had they say okay god is answering my prayer no that's not going to answer your prayer because that prayer is against the bible it's against the word of god and there may be many people among us who are bought into that line who are bought into that deception that instead of praying positively for the people that actively hate us were praying negatively and were wishing negative or deserving something negative against them come back to the scriptures it says therefore you know the meaning of therefore because of the love of god in your heart and because of what grace of god has come to you it says therefore because of all this thing that was studied and because of eternity it says therefore if thine enemy hunger the what feeding if he thirst tell me give him drink then he says for his so doing thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head be not overcome of evil be not overcome of evil when people do evil to you and then you retaliate you are overcome of that evil that evil they have done the action they have taken that action has destroyed your christian life and destroyed your christian perception but it says be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with with good with kindness, with graciousness, and with the life of Christ. I want to examine this uh, passage with you on the believer's reflection of Christ's love. The believer's reflection of Christ's love. What that means is that the love of Christ comes to you, and in that love of Christ, you reflect that 
from your heart. You don't reflect the human nature. You don't reflect your human desires, but you reflect the nature of Christ and the love of Christ and the light of Christ. The believer's reflection of Christ's love. One attribute and um, one character of Christ which is unique and which has been from all eternity and will continue till all eternity is love. And that love comes in our heart, comes into our personality and then affects us and influences us. All believers have tasted of this law because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life and that law is shared abroad in our heart and is to flow from us and flow to other people what people know about us for us shall not be our knowledge should be our love what people know about us for us should not be our tribe should be our love what people know about us for us is not our doctrine you know i believe this i believe that should be our love because this love of god is shared abroad in our heart it is a birth mark what we call a birth mark you know sometimes you see a brother you see a sister has a particular mark on the face and it wasn't that uh, the parents uh, did that it just that's the way the person was born we call it a birth mark and love should be the birth mark that will carry through to eternity the believers reflection of christ's love there are three things we're going to consider number one reviving costly love among the flock costly love love that is costly costly love reviving costly love among the flock number two renewing compassionate love within the fellowship renewing it it's been there and sometimes it gets dormant sometimes it gets forgotten sometimes some other attributes or attitudes cover that love up but you remove all the debris and all the dirty things that cloud that and you renew compassionate love within the fellowship now number three reflecting courageous love reflecting courageous love toward our foes towards our foes the foes are the enemies the foes are the opposers the foes are the people that contradict the foes are the people that try to hurt us the foes are the people that try to hinder us reflecting courageous love towards our foes you say i've never heard of courageous love yes there's courageous love courageous love a mother is going up with a child and they're about to cross the road and the child mistakenly has gone before the mother and the car is coming all of a sudden the mother sees that and sees that that uh, car may crush that child and because of the love of the mother she rushes there picks up the child and then dashes up the road that's courageous love other people will not be able to do that they will be mindful of their lives they will be mindful of their safety they see the car coming if i go there i don't know what will happen but the mother has courageous love and you know if you're going to love your enemies it's going to take some courage because uh, he's bragging is boasting, is pointing the finger at you. He doesn't hide his hatred. And yet, the Lord said, show him love. Show him who God is. And show him the power of love. And that's going to take courage when you overlook what he has said. You overlook what he is doing. And then you show the love of Christ. Reflecting courageous love towards our foes. Point number one. Tell me number one there. God bless you. Very costly love among the flock. We're coming back to Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Let it be transparent. Let it be real. Don't have any show and don't have any kind of make believe. 
and don't just say something you don't mind be factual be truthful be sincere be honest and let the love be real that's why it says let love be without dissimulation as you as you interact with people and they seem to practice what they call love many times you'll see that people have ulterior motives many times people are dishonest and many times people are insincere many times people do not actually have that love of christ flowing from their heart and flowing to people because they pretend because they're hypocritical because the things they show and the things they do they want to do this so that you give them this uh -uh, that one has ulterior motive they want to do this so that you'll think well of them that has ulterior motive it says let your love be christ kind of love let it be costly love and let it be something that comes from you and comes to the people without any duplicity and without any deception and without any hypocrisy and without any pretense and without any ulterior motive asking for something or looking for something such love does not count the cost such love does not count because it is calvary love it is christ-like love it is costly love and uh, it is a kind of love that is shed abroad in our heart and we just want to help the people we're not thinking of ourselves that kind of love is only thinking about the need of that brother and the need of that sister and the need that i need to supply that i need to meet and even though it costs me something it might cost him nothing isn't that the love of christ it it cost him his very life. It cost him his very blood. It cost him to shed all that he had from eternity and to lay all that aside and then to show that love to us when we meant nothing to him, when we would not pay back anything at all, is the costly love of Calvary. That we're only thinking of the need of the brother. We're only thinking of the need of the sister. And we're not thinking of the pain it may cost us because of that we visit because of that we give because of that we help because of that we pray for people because of that we support we support the people that need our support and because of that we bear the bodies of other people and we bear the bodies until their problems are solved until all the heartache they have all the sicknesses they have all the challenges they have until all those problems are solved that's the cost it costs you something and and then you are not counting because I've done this and the problem is still not solved. Keep on doing it until the problem is solved. This love does not attach any unattainable condition. There are people that they want to do something. If somebody wants to lend you 100,000 naira. And then he says, you must come and give me a guarantee of 80,000 naira. My friend, if that person had 80,000 naira, he'll not be looking for 100,000 naira. They're so near each other. You're giving an unattainable condition. Okay, I'm going to do this for you, but you must do this first. And you must, uh, you know, pour down some water so that I can march on the fresh tech ground. You're giving some condition that the fellow may not be able to attain or obtain. Therefore, the love we're talking about is this costly love is this christ-like love and it is this calvary love that doesn't have any unattainable condition attached to it it is not the kind of love that someone has to earn by marriage you know there are people before they can love you you have to earn it you have to earn it you have to be so good 
hypersensitively good before they'll smile at you and say, that's nice, you're getting better. Now I can love you because I see that you are better. It is not something we earn by merit. We're talking of the cause, what it cost Jesus Christ to go to the cross of Calvary and to die for us. Are you measuring your love like that? Who are the people you love in the fellowship? Who are the people you interact with in the fellowship? Are they the people that say what you want them to say? That do what you want them to do? That dress the way you want them to dress? That dot your eye and crosses your T? Are they the people that satisfy you in every detail? That's no more love. You're just rewarding them for what they have, what they are paid for. Or what they are paid for, you are giving back to them. But we're talking of the costly love that it is not by merit. The cost is not on the side of the receiver. The cost is on the side of the giver. And that's the love of Christ. The love of Christ cost him something, cost him his life. But we receive that love without paying for it. The cost of salvation is not on our side. The cost of eternal life is not on our side. The cost of the goodness of God, the grace of God, is not on our side. The cost is on the side of the Lord himself. The same thing with the cost of love we're talking about, that cost is not on the recipient, the one receiving that love, the cause is on the side of the person who is giving that love. This love, Christ-like love, constant love, practical love, helpful love it is that we give to people. Now, how we need such love renewed and revived in our midst as in the good old days when we started the house fellowship people just ran to the house fellowship because the house fellowship was new that fellowship was fresh and because of that we, just, we visited people were you there at that time I said, were you there at that time? Maybe we even visited you. And said, so see how these people love. And you've been going to other churches before. We didn't even tell you, leave your church or leave whatever. We didn't preach against your church. But we just said, they love me like this. And this happened. See what they did for me. See what they bought for me. That love will come back. And when that love comes back, you will not think of the distance it will take you to reach that person. You will not think of uh, the sweat you have to go through before you touch the life of that person. It's the costly love of Jesus Christ coming from you. And that's exactly what Christ expects that we should have. We're looking at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm reading here from verse 12. John chapter 15. And I'm reading here from verse 12. It says in verse 12. Well, this is my commandment that she love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. I see some people nowadays, the way they love is that, okay, the way he has loved me. He overlooked me, I'll overlook him. He didn't greet me, why should I greet him? He didn't, uh, you know, even talk to me. Why should I talk to him? And he said, dear Christians, but Jesus said, it's not what they do. And it is not how they act. And it is not their action or their attitude towards you. If you are waiting until the world smiles, I feel before you smile, you'll never smile. You'll never smile. Because, you see, we see them on the street. We see them in the bars. We see them everywhere. They're carrying such heavy load on them that they never smile. If you are waiting for them to smile before you smile back at them, you will never smile. But when you originate it, when you initiate it, when you get it started, like Jesus Christ got you started. If Jesus waited for the world to invite him before he came, he would never have come. If God waited for the world to demand for that love or show some love, he would never have come. But God so loved the world. When we were yet his enemies, God might manifested that love unto us and is telling us here this is my commandment that she love one another as I have loved you look at verse 13 greater love has no man than this this costly love costly love greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends will do it in Jesus name you say how do you lay something down for other people I'm looking at Job chapter 29 
Job chapter 29. I'm reading here from verse 11. It says, When the ear heard me, then it blessed me. And when the eye saw me, it gave witness to me. Because this is the reason why I delivered the poor that cried. That's the love, practical love, costly love. I delivered the, the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that uh, that had none to help him. I helped them. The blessing of him uh, that was ready to perish came uh, upon me. You see that? You see that? They are ready to perish with hunger. They are ready to perish with thirst. They are ready to perish with their need. And then it says, the blessing of him uh, that was ready to perish came uh, upon me. And I caused the widow a heart, the widow's heart. Tell me, you tell me out aloud. Aha, uh -huh. sick now in your local church. Any widow there? I don't know. You don't know because you didn't find out. The widows are there. They lost their husbands. They lost the breadwinner in the family. And yet nobody is thinking of them. I come to church, they come to church, we come to church, you know, we do the singing, we do the uh, preaching, we hear everything, and then praise the Lord, we pray, and then we go. Oh, we're asking for now, Lord, give me this, give me this, give me this. And the widow is there, we're not taking care of the fatherless are there, we're not taking care of the oppressed are there, we're not taking care of them. Church continues, fellowship continues, preaching continues ministry continues but we're not doing what job said here that he did and we will begin to do this i said we'll begin to do this look at verse 14 he said i put on righteousness and it closed me and my judgment is said was as a robe and a diadem i was tell me now tell me out loud I was eyes to the blind and the blind man did not feel he was blind because I said I'll supply that need I was eyes to the blind where the blind would have gone and in which if I had somebody to take me there, I said I'm here I'm here I'll take you there and then where the lame would have gone and you didn't know where to go because you know I don't have any legs I cannot move like other people I said I'm here I'll be legs for you look at that verse again it says I was eyes to the blind and tell me Feet was I to the lame. Feet was I to the lame. Job said, I can't perform a miracle and open the eyes of the blind, but I give myself as a servant to those blind people and I'll take them where they ought to go. I cannot perform a miracle to make the lame to rise up and walk, but I will make sure that I supply that need. I'll become their legs and then I will take them to where they ought to go. That's what the Lord is requesting of us. And that's what the Lord is saying that we should manifest this costly love and this practical love. It will be done. I'm looking at Job chapter 31. Job chapter 31. And we're reading from verse 16. Job chapter 31 verse 16. It says, if I have withheld the poor from their desire or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or if I have eaten my muscle myself alone. It says, the food I have, and you know he had many children, and yet he said, I didn't eat my food alone. I was always having something to give out to the people that were hungry. This is a practical love, and this is the Christian love, Christ-like love, costly love, that the Lord is demanding from us. It says, so I have eaten my muscle, myself alone, or the fatherless has not eaten thereof. He said, I will search for them. I look for them and if they will not come to me I go to them and that's what the Lord is asking us to do that the fatherless who are there there's nobody to pay their school fees somebody is searching them out are they dropping out of school we get them back to school are they ejected out of accommodation and God has blessed us and we have something that can pay for the accommodation costly love we're going to do it in Jesus name or they are jobless if we don't have any job to give them we're supporting them we're 
are sustaining them. And then it says in verse 19, in verse 19, or if I have seen any perish for want of clothing, or any poor without covering, if his loins have not blessed me, and if he were not want with the fleece of my sheep. And then he goes on like that. He's telling us what we want to do, that the love we're talking about is not just, you know, we study it in the Bible, we read it in the Bible, and after reading in the Bible, then we forget all about it. He said, no, it must go on. I to flow through you and flow through me in Jesus' name. He's telling us in uh, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, uh, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Romans chapter 16 verses 3 and 4 tells us the manifestation of the love that Paul the Apostle had to comment about. He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila help us in Christ Jesus. Help us. Paul the Apostle said, I, I saw help. I received help. You remember Paul the Apostle? Paul the Apostle was the person that says, I have learned in whatever state I am there to be contained I know how to abound I know how to be a base everywhere I'm touched I could be hungry and I would not mind and I could be full and I would not mind and the people did not say well Paul he doesn't, he doesn't need food Paul he doesn't need water even if you give him they tell you that I've lunched in whatever state I am to be contained let him go hungry that's the attitude of some people who oh, say that man doesn't care for clothing. That man doesn't care for, you know, food. That man doesn't care and he's always cheerful the weather he has or he doesn't have is uh, learned how to endure everything uh, and yet they don't give anything. And this Paul, the apostle said, I'm greeting uh, Priscilla. I'm greeting Aquila. You know what he did? Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give them, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. It says, it's not only myself. We all know them. That family, they just care for people. That family, they just uh, splash costly love upon people. I pray we'll be like that in Jesus' name. And then our love will be something pure, something enriching, something fervent, something not hidden, something obvious. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. To sin, ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love. That's it, unpretending love. A, a love that is not hypocritical, not dishonest, a love that is transparent unto unfeigned love of the brethren. And then he goes on to say that ye love one another with a pure heart. Tell me the last word there. Fervently. It says we shall love each other fervently. Not the kind of love we are ditching out. You know, we are measuring it. Then we give a little peace and then if the person is still waiting, that's not enough. And then we give a little peace and if that's not enough, then we give a little peace and we do it out like we are giving cobble and uh, five naira peace says something to the beggar. Not something like that, but something from all your heart, an expression of love. Something that comes from the depth of your heart and is flowing out to them and you do it exactly there. You do it happily and you do it fervently. I come to point number two. It says a renewing compassionate love within the fellowship. We're coming back to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 13. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 13 over here in verse 13 what does it say? Look at your Bible Romans chapter 12, verse 13 it says in verse 13 distributing to the necessity of saints giving to hospitality that word, that word given means you are abandoned to hospitality it means you give yourself to hospitality. It's like you forget yourself in hospitality. You forget yourself in doing good. You just do good and do good and do good. You are addicted 
to do good. Like some of the people are addicted to drugs, they're addicted to alcohol, they're addicted to beer, you're addicted to goodness. Do good to all people, you are abandoned to hospitality. It tells us in verse 15, in verse 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice, be excited with the people who are excited in life and rejoice with the people and they have something that happened to them and they are happy, rejoice with them. Now, in life you'll find those who are always moody, those who are always morose, those who are always sad, they say that's their nature. I don't think that's their nature. I think uh, all the things that happened in life just beclouded them, just made them blind to excitement in life. And they have nothing to rejoice about. Then there are other people that are excited, they are happy, and life is okay with them. And there are some people, they look at those two groups and they say, this one are my people. They must have the same load and the same burden and the same oppression that I have. I think I'll join these people, don't join them be excited in life. You have a lot to praise God for. I said you have a lot to praise God for. The love of Christ is there. The salvation of the Lord is there. Eternal life is there. Inheritance in heaven is there. And the opportunity to serve the Lord is there. Be excited. And then it says, you see other people that are rejoicing. Join them and rejoice with them. Then it goes on to say, and weep with them that weep. And be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Tell me the rest there. They're not wise in your own conceits. There are people that are no more teachable, no more amenable to teaching, and no more submissive to teaching. It's like, you know, this is what they are doing, and this is what they will always do. It's like there's no change that can come in their lives. They've made up their minds that this is the direction I'm going, and that's the wisest thing I will do. There's no teaching, there is no doctrine, and there's no preaching that will change them. It says, don't do that. Be not wise in your own conceit. You hear the word of God, like the one you are hearing now, you go back to your district, go back home, and you are going to do something you have never done before. You are going to search for the widows. Maybe you have not been doing that. You are going to search for the fatherless, and you are going to help people, and then all those shoes that are just lying yours, you have not worn them for five years, bring them out, and give them out. All those clothes you are just hanging there. There are people that have nothing to use and those things are there and they're just getting they're destroyed over there. Bring them up dry, clean them and then if you have to make an announcement, you don't have to, but you can look for people and next Sunday will be a day of distribution. Amen. Give me a good amen. amen. It's good to distribute tracks. I will distribute your eyes. It's wonderful to distribute tracks. I will distribute your clothes. It's wonderful to distribute, you know, the word of life and this track. And we're going about what I about in our church. And we look at all these people. And then we say, today is going to be a day of distribution. Clothes distribution. Give me a good amen. amen. And food distribution. Give me a good amen. amen. Only when we're going for the retreat, we'll make announcement, we need to buy rice, we need to buy this and buy this and buy that, and then we all contribute money, and then we give to the people. Then we tell our friends who are inviting to the retreat, only from Thursday night to Sunday, we say there is free food. Many of our own people who are with us, apart from retreat time, they don't have enough to eat. Why don't we get a one Sunday rice distribution Sunday? tell me a good amen. amen. And then there is a Gary distribution Sunday. Peace distribution Sunday. And then we came to church uh, that day and we say, wait, don't go. We're going to have a kind of distribution today because the love of God is flowing in our heart. You know, I'm eating too much. I'm taking too much. My brothers and sisters have nothing to eat. And we're going to take part of what we have. We're going to give to them in Jesus' name. And that's why it's saying here, it says, be not wise in your own conceit and compassion passionate love is a spontaneous love. It is not a forced love. It is not an administrative force. That is, it is not by administration. I 
and we are not doing it by an external stimulus it does not wait for order does not wait for a commandment before we offer to help other people the people that are saying because they didn't tell us to or the bible tells you to did you command us to do that the holy spirit commands you to do that i didn't know that i could give anything to the people in need christ already said so and christ already said this is what to do and the word of god was telling you here are the commandments of god and it says this is what to do we don't need we don't need somebody to coordinate this one administration for this one we don't need somebody to tell us and push us and force us to that it is our nature it's our nature and that nature will flow through you in jesus name the love of god flowing through us and getting to the lives of other people and people say i'm happy i'm a christian i'm happy i'm a member of this church i'm happy i wasn't even thinking of this i just wanted to go to church i said even if i have to die in church i will die with the lord and then as i made up my mind and consecrated myself that i will die serving the lord somebody just gave me something and then you know we came out to so I put something in my hand when did i see ten thousand naira last in my life and this person just said brother how are you i thought he wanted to shake my hand and then drop ten thousand in my hand drop fifty thousand in my hand you know somebody somebody said what's your account and you know these are not dubious people you know these people that are asking for your bank account uh, you know bank uh, account number and then you give them and then the following day they send you a alert that somebody transferred thirty five thousand to your account me when last did I see that? That's what we're talking about. That we surprise them with the love of God. And that love, compassionate love, will continue to flow in our lives in Jesus' name. And there is the free flow of the mercy of God, of the compassion of the Lord to those people who are in need. And then it's like rain coming from heaven. And like showers coming from heaven. And it comes upon their hearts in a dry and weary land. God is love and Christ always moved with compassion where Christ lives unhindered unrestricted and not constrained that same love will flow from our hearts towards them in Jesus name and let's look at the Acts of the Apostles chapter 9 Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 39. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, verse 39. And let's see the manifestation of this love. Acts 9, verse 39. It says in verse 39, Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him unto the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing up the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. You see that? Peter was not there. Peter didn't make any announcement. The apostle was not there to make any announcement. All of her own, this dock has the clothes and the garments and the needs of the people of the widows there, just kept on giving out and giving out and giving out. And I pray that the Lord will help you. You'll have this in mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How the Lord just gave himself to the people. How he expects you to give yourself to the people. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 35. Acts chapter 20, we're reading from verse 35. I have showed you all things. How that so laboring ye ought to support the weak support the weak not criticize the weak support the weak not put pressure on the weak support the weak not um, you know do anything negative to the weak but support the weak and then and to remember the words of the lord jesus how he said tell me out loud it is more blessed to give than to receive. Look up here for a moment. Have you seen in all the churches, all denominations, 
in our land. All denominations in our continent of Africa that we have changed the word of God. It is more blessed to receive than to give. The prayer meetings are like that. The night vigils are like that. And the prosperity preaching, everything is like that. All we want, it is more blessed to receive than to give. And we have raised up, uh, I say we, not me in particular, but in all these churches, we have raised up uh, the community or the congregation or the assembly of selfish people, self-centered people, the people that they never think of, you know, what you need. Do you not think of what other people want? It's like it is more blessed to receive than to give. And the richer they are, the more they are still demanding. And the poorer are becoming poorer, and the richer are becoming the richer, becoming richer. But the words of Jesus Christ says, it is more blessed, tell me, to give than to receive. When last did you give? When last did you do something for other people that are less privileged than yourself? For other people that need some money, they need some clothing, they need some food, they need some accommodation, they need some things in life. When last did you do that? And when last did it cost you so much that you just, you felt it? You know, I need this money, I need this thing, but that my brother needs it more, that my sister needs it more. And because of that, I have to get into this compassionate love and I pray it will start from today in your life it will start in my life it will start and then we are giving it out and you might feel it at the beginning do it again then you feel it do it again and then as you continue as you sow into other people's lives the Lord will sow into your life in Jesus name Galatians chapter 6 I'm reading from verse 10 Galatians chapter 6 and I'm reading from verse 10 it says as we have therefore opportunity as we have therefore opportunity let us tell me do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith it says as we have opportunity as we have opportunity as we have opportunity the problem is I never have opportunity ah, don't tell me that look we are finishing the meeting tonight and as we are finishing don't tell me you don't know that brother is from your local area don't tell me you don't know that sister is from your street and you have a car and only yourself and your wife and the rest of the seats three seats are empty there and then you see that sister's standing there. That's an opportunity right there. An opportunity right there. Or maybe you don't have a car, but you are standing there and the other person is standing here. We're just coming from the meeting together and you are waiting for bus or transportation. That's an opportunity right there to discuss. Oh, brother, how are you? What's your name? And where do you live? Where are you going now? And what's uh, what's your need? And uh, what is this? And what is that? That's an opportunity right there. And it says as we have opportunity, let us do let us do what? Let us do good unto all men, especially now. The people that bear the same name of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially the people that bear the same name of Christianity and the same name of deeper life. There are some people, they can do good to uh, somebody they are trying to invite and trying to influence. And then they give to the members of all those other churches, they are trying to win them over. Once they win them over, they abandon them but there are people who are here there are people who are deeper life with you and they have this need and they have this need and they have that need especially them of the household of faith we will do it you may go there amen there and because this is what the Lord is telling us look at Jeremiah chapter 38 Jeremiah chapter 38 I'm reading here from verse 7 Jeremiah chapter 38 we're looking at verse 7 and look at the needs of other people and look at how we meet the needs of other people Jeremiah chapter 38 and we're looking at verse 7 it says in verse 7 now when Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. 
the king then sit in the gate of Benjamin. And it says, Abimelech in verse 8 went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet whom they have cast into the dungeon and he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is for there is no more bread in the city then the king commanded Abimelech, the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah, the prophet, out of the dungeon before he died. You see this? Jeremiah did not approach this person because he was in the dungeon. He would have been forgotten there. And this man became concerned that Jeremiah was in the dungeon. And the people that uh, conspired against him and put him there, but he went on his own. He went to speak to the king on his behalf. He said, my lord the king, this Jeremiah will die here. There's no bread in the city and there's no water there. And if they leave him in that dungeon, the man will die there. You see, that's being a help to another person, a person going through persecution going through opposition and go through the attacks of the enemy and then the king said go and take how many people 30 people 30 men and get Jeremiah out of that place that's the kind of love the Lord is calling us to show to other people when you see them in danger you see them in difficulty you see them in something that's beyond their control that God will use you and then you'll be able to bring them out of that place in Jesus name we're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 2 Philippians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 2 Philippians chapter 2 and we're reading from from verse 2. It says, Fulfill ye my joy that she be the like minded, having the same love. That's it, having the same love and being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through. Tell me, strive for vain glory. Our ministry, don't let it be out of strife and vain glory. And our doing good, not out of strife and vain glory. Our working for the Lord, not out of strife and vain glory. Let nothing be done through strife of vain glory. It's, then it goes on to say, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on also on the things of others. Look for the benefit of other people, for the upliftment of other people, for the encouragement of other people, not for your own benefit or encouragement only. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm looking at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 3. It says, Remember them that are in bonds. Any kind of difficulty, any kind of bondage, any kind of sickness, any kind of deep vision it says remember them that are in bonds as bound with them as if you are incarcerated with them as if you are confined with them as if you are imprisoned with them but remember them that are in bonds as bound with them those that are sick as if you were sick with them those that are jobless, as if you are jobless with them. And those that are going through persecution, as if you are going through that same persecution with them. Those that have family problems, we don't gossip about them. Ah, look at that brother. And look at that sister. And look at what they are going through. No, we don't gossip. As if you were in that same predicament with them. It says, remember them which are bound. As if you are bound with them. And then it says, and they which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. And that's what we are going to do in Jesus' name. And that is the Christ-like love. That is the compassionate love that you want to show in the fellowship. We're coming to point number three now. What's point number three again over there? 
reflecting a courageous love towards our foes. And here is where you really now have to understand here is the word of God, and that you do not allow the culture of your background, or the culture of your tribe, or the culture of your nation to influence you. Uh, what's the culture in uh, many nations, in many tribes? That tribe fought against our forefathers about 50, 60, 70 years ago. You are not even born then. And now they transferred that hatred for that tribe. They transferred that to your mind. And they say, we have nothing to do with them. We don't greet them. We don't help them. We don't sit with them. We don't do anything with them. That village and our village, they have nothing to come out. They have nothing to do together. They are our sworn enemies and there's perpetual hatred between them and our family and they sold that to you like Esau sold to the Edomites to the people of Edom and they hated Jacob and they hated Israel because of what Jacob had apologized for many years before and those people still carry that on if you read the book of Obadiah Almost the whole of Obadiah is on that. The Edomites, they were, they were vehement enemies of those Israelites. And when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, all that enmity vanishes away. All that tribal enmity vanishes away. And the tribal culture, everything vanishes away. And we do not live according to culture. We do not act according to culture. Ah, we don't marry from that area. No, we don't uh, do this with those other people. We don't interact with those other people. If they're Christian, is they're born again, they're children of God, we are bought and redeemed and purchased and purified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are one together. And we're united together. And it says we must manifest the love towards the people. This is courageous love. We're coming to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 12 from verse 17. It says recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. It says and if it be possible as much as lies in you. Labor peaceably tell me with all men live peaceably with all men uh -huh. if you cannot live peaceably with your wife how can you live peaceably with all men you can not live peaceably with your mother-in-law how can you live peaceably with all men you cannot live peaceably with members of the church and those who come to the same fellowship believe the same doctrine and we're going to the same heaven and there's always wrong always conflict always disagreement always division always whatever it is you cannot live peaceably with those people who are near to you read the bible with you believe the word of god with you how can you live peaceably with all men and, and you, can, you can tell somebody has not uh, gotten married you're still a young lady and you're still looking up to the Lord but you know every little thing offends you in the fellowship that's my enemy in the fellowship that's my enemy that's my enemy and the men they see that and they see your attitude and they see that you wear your emotion on your skin it's like you know you're always moody and you're always you know dangerous and terrible because they all offend me. Nobody understands me. I can live peaceably with all men. And the same thing. There are men that are just like that. They wear the emotion on their sleeves. You cannot get along with them. If you mistakenly just uh, push them like this, they ought to push me down. What did I do? Why did you do that? And all the, and they begin to shout on you. And they point fingers at your face. You have to take your nose away. Let's say poke your nose. Uh, and they say, anyway, 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 I forgive you now but next time they are watching if you are not married yet those ladies are afraid that that man a little thing and they might always cut off your head and what it in the papers how you know something happened and then this person got rid of that i don't want that to happen to me it will not happen to me 
I'm talking about myself, it will not happen to me. Uh -huh. that's, that's why it says if you're a Christian, you show the mild nature of Christ and the loving nature of Christ and the gentle nature of Christ. And you say that love, everybody will see it. Surely if you were a boxer before, boxing is gone. Amen. Give me a good amen. amen. If you're a wrestler before, I will show them. Huh? You don't have anything to show anymore because that nature and characteristic of boxing and wrestling, all that is gone away. Then you are now a child of God and you have the heart of Christ and the heart of love and the heart of gentleness. And it says over here that as it is possible, as much as lies in you, your power, live peaceably with all men. It says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Dearly be beloved, tell me. Dearly beloved, say it aloud. Dearly beloved, say it again. And you know there are people that are, you know teeth for tat. You do that for me. I know how to do that too. You use that kind of language on me. I'll tell you. I know worse vocabulary in the dictionary. I'll dig them out and throw them at you. There are people who call themselves Christians. Retaliation and revenge. And what other people have done to them, they throw it back. If you throw more than them, accidentally, mistakenly, they say, I'll show you. Then they go and take something harder. They throw it at you and they almost break your... Why did they do that to me? Hey, how about you? What you did two days ago? I forgot. You do your own now. Now it comes to my turn and you are complaining. That's not Christianity. Christianity is, is done that to me. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And if a person is in the habit, in the mind of retaliating, 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 and it becomes your habit, it becomes your lifestyle, it becomes your very heart, and you're going to lose the very nature of Christ, and you're going to lose the attribute of Christ. That's why it says, Deadly beloved, avenge not yourselves. And it says, Neither give place unto wrath, unto anger, unto bitterness, unto hatred. It says, For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, tell me, feed him. If thine enemy hunger, now don't look now. If you are going to answer, you look up at me. If your enemy hunger, Feed him. Ah, look at this. The husband said something I didn't like. And I'm the wife. You're not making an illustration. I'm not your wife. <laughs> and then, uh, ah, honey, when are we going to take dinner? Dinner? I will go to the kitchen today and cook for a person like you, a rascal like you. You know how to eat. Me, not me today. Go there yourself and go and cook. If your enemy hunger, <laughs> hey, my husband, the money food has finished, and we need such and such an amount now. Hey, go and get it. Money for food. There are some women. They never will be husband. We tell them, do this, they never do it. Do this, they never do it. Now they're asking for chop money. No money. Today, you will submit. After submission, money will come. If your enemy hunger, and you do that cheerfully. Be Christian. And all these uh, things that have come in, that came in from tradition, that came in from all the backyard of the unbelievers, will throw them away tonight in Jesus' name. There will be peace in our families. There will be love in our families. And there will be love that shares in fellowship with everyone in our families in Jesus' name. Because it says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger feed him, if he thirst, tell me, 
give him glory for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head for and then he says be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good god will help us in jesus name I, i'm looking at i'm looking at uh, first peter chapter 3 and i'm looking at verse 9 first peter chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 9 first peter chapter 3 we're looking at verse 9 it says not rendering evil for evil never never not rendering evil for evil i'll punish him i'll oppress him i will uh, kind of uh, i would destroy him he knows how to you know hurt other people i will show him that me too i know how to hurt people only i was i've been waiting don't you know keep on waiting never do that it says uh, you are not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing but contrary wise blessing Knowing that ye are their ways called, down to called, that ye should inherit a blessing. I pray that this characteristic the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. And then we're looking at Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25, and I'm reading here from verse 21. Proverbs chapter 25, from verse 21. If then any may be hungry, Giving bread to it, giving bread to it, giving bread to it. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink, for thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and tell me the rest. And the Lord shall do what? And the Lord shall reward you. What does that mean? How does the Lord reward somebody for heaping coals of fire upon his head? Because his heart is hardened, it's like wax and it's hardened and it's hardened in evil it's hardened in wanting to do bad bad things and because of that he's not hearing the word of god he's not hearing whatever it is and then he has this hatred in him and he's hardened with hatred and then he shows that hatred to a child of god and that person fed him while he was hungry and that person gave him water while he was thirsty and the bread and the water became like fire that brought him under conviction that melted his heart the preaching could not melt him and the commandment could not melt him and whatever it is what they could not melt him but this goodness and this kindness melted his heart like fire melts iron like it melts the wax and then he repents to the lord before the lord and gave himself to the lord and then the lord said you are the one preaching could not catch him and all the ministry could not catch him but your goodness your feeling caught him and now he's born again and the lord will reward you in jesus name it tells us uh, in uh, chapter 24 look at this chapter 24 of first samuel first samuel chapter 24 and i'm reading from verse 8 for samuel chapter 24 i'm reading from verse 8 it is the story about uh, David and Saul. And Saul was, uh, you know, harassing the life of David and making David run helter skelter. And then David had a chance that if he wanted to kill him, he could have killed him, but he did not. And this is the illustration we're talking about. First Samuel chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 8. And David also arose up to watch and went out of the cave and uh, cried after Saul saying, my lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stood with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said unto Saul, Wherefore? Here is thou the men's word, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy heart behold this day thine uh, eyes have seen uh, how that the lord had delivered thee this today into mine hand in the cave and some bid me kill thee but mine eyes pierce thee and i said i will not put forth mine hand against my lord for he is the lord's anointed. Moreover, my father 
see ye see the skirt of thy robe in my hand for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not that know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand and I have not sinned against thee yet thou huntest my soul to take it and the Lord judge you no know, he went on uh, to talk about how the Lord will respond to everything let's look at verse 16 now in verse 16 and it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul that Saul said is this thy voice my enemy David what my son David you know he counted him as enemy but now that act of kindness and that act of goodness had changed him said that is my son David and so lifted up his voice tell me tell me out loud his heart was melted. That's what we're talking about. When, you, when your enemy does evil to you, evil wants to kill you and destroy your life, and you find him, and instead of repaying him evil for evil, you do good unto them, you melt their hearts, and then they weep like babies, like Saul wept over there. That's what the Lord is saying to us, that when your enemy hungers, you'll do what? And when they assess you, you'll do what? You'll give them drink. And this is what the Lord is uh, reminding us, that we need to return. Instead of returning hatred for hatred, that's a beastly nature. That's human weakness. That's a human depravity. But instead of that, actually like the natural people, always angry, always bitter, always hateful, always revengeful. Instead of you know, acting like people who are always holding grudges against people and keeping malice, it says that we shall have the strength of character and the courage of love that will return their evil with goodness. And that we confront all the evil they do or the kindness of the Lord, we meet hatred with love and then we respond to their wrongdoing with right appreciation and with right action and with right attitude. And we will not be that will be like the coals of fire upon their head, and then their hearts will be melted, and they'll be in submission to the Lord, and the love of God will walk in our lives to transform from the lives of all these enemies and opposers in Jesus' name. As we round up, let me let me go to Romans now. Romans, I'm reading from chapter five. Romans. We're looking at chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 5. Romans talking to us about love. In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says, uh, Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of, tell me, the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It tells us that this love we're talking about is the love of God. This goes beyond human love natural love. This goes beyond the love of people who are not born again, but the people who are born again, they have the love of God. Look at verse 8. It says, for God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, tell me, Christ died for us. It says this is the kind of love he wants us to manifest. It is the love of God. Not only the love of God, the love of Christ. I'm looking at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, I'm looking at verse 10. 35. Romans chapter 8 verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? From the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy cause. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the, for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. Number one, the love of God. Number two, the love of Christ. We're coming to Romans chapter 15. 
Romans chapter 15. I'm, to, I'm reading from verse 30. Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit. For the love of the Spirit. It talks about the love of God, God the Father. It talks about the love of Christ, the Son of God. And it talks about the love of the Spirit. Trinitarian love. Coming from the Father, coming through Jesus and coming in by the ministration of the Holy Spirit. We're coming to chapter 12. Chapter 12. I'm reading from verses 9 and 10. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cling to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with what kind of love? Brotherly love. The love of God, that's in Romans. The love of Christ, that's in Romans. The love of the Spirit, that's in Romans. And the love of the brethren, the love of brothers and sisters. Uh, that's uh, chapter 12. Look at chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 8. Chapter 13, verse 8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. Namely, thou shalt love. Tell me thy neighbor as thyself. You know what Romans is talking about? Romans is talking about the love of God. It's talking about the love of Christ. It's talking about the love of the Spirit. It's talking about the love of the brethren. And it's also talking about the love of our neighbors. And it says this kind of love should continue. Look at verse 10. It says love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And then when we have this love, something good will always happen to you. I said something good will always happen to you. Look at Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know. And we know certainly. And we know definitely. And we know assuredly. And we know that all things work together for good to them that to them that to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. He says, let this love of God be shed abroad in your heart. The love of God, the love of Christ, the love of the Spirit, and the love of the brethren, and the love of our neighbors and then you conquer by this and then it says all things in your life will work for good. Work by love. Whatever other people do, however other people act, whatever it is they are manifesting, you know that your calling is walk in love and walk in love and walk in love and good will always happen to you in Jesus name. Let's rest up and talk to the Lord in prayer that what the Lord has spoken about today, costly love compassionate love, courageous love will walk in your life and that you will manifest this everywhere you find yourself and this love will be practical, this love will be purposeful, this love will be preeminent in your life. It will be on and on and on. Never hatred, never animosity, and never anything that is negative. Let the love begin to be and distribute to the necessity of the saints, necessity of the people around you. Let this love be manifest everywhere.